Welcome, everybody. My name is Michael Mayo. I am with the Manatee Springs Heritage Center and Museum. And uh, we are doing a series of oral histories involving longtime residents of Manatee Springs. One of those residents who is our guest today is Shirley Wade. And uh, Shirley's been a resident for, what, since 1948 or so? On and off. On and off. Okay. Um, Shirley, uh, what, what is your date of birth, just to kick things off here? And The date of birth, 1933. 1933. So you came here in 1948. And uh, how did your family arrive here in Manitou Springs? Who were your parents and how did they end up here? Well, it's uh, the Cliff House is what brought my family to Manitou Springs in 1948 between Christmas and New Year's. And uh, my uncle and aunt owned a wholesale travel agency in Chicago. They sent tours to Colorado after World War II, which was very lucrative business. And they sent them to Estes Park, Grand Lake, and Manitou Springs. Well, my uncle saw that E.E. E. Nichols was selling the Cliff House. So he and a silent partner bought the Cliff House in 1948. They thought they could make more money with their tours by bringing them here and having and owning the hotel that they stayed in. Well, after World War II, my father lost his job uh, in defense plant after he helped convert the defense plant to uh, uh, peacetime work. So Uncle Stewart says, why don't you go out to Manitou and clean up the Cliff House for me? It was really in pretty, uh, pretty poor condition. It, it needed cleaning up. And while we didn't use the word restore in those days, it did need rehabbing. Mm -hmm. So my mom and dad came out. And of course, I was a high school kid and I had to come along, which was the best thing that ever happened for to me. Anyway, they stayed for 10 years uh, during the whole time, uh, the whole tenure of the ownership of the Cliff House. My dad was the maintenance man. My mother was the housekeeper. She made all the new drapes and bedspreads for the Cliff House. And dad and I helped tear down some old, old pieces of wallpaper just hanging and taking out broken pieces of furniture, etc. The Cliff House story started actually in Chicago, uh, where your uncle was part of an ownership group. Um, and that group, I believe, would have been the Nelford Corporation. Were you born in Chicago? or I was I born it's... outside of Chicago okay. in an area called Downers Grove Township. Okay. Yes. Okay. And so the family moves out here. You mentioned that your father was involved with the maintenance to some capacity, and your mother also participated in making curtains and just, uh, I guess I would imagine, cleaning rooms and things like that. Oh, yeah, we had to really clean the hotel before it could be open. But let me digress just for a moment. Back in those days, Manitou Springs tourist town was only active during the summer months, sort of like from Memorial Day to Labor Day. Uh, it wasn't a year around tourist town. So the Cliff House was closed and it allowed for many months of uh, redoing, rebuilding, restoring uh, the uh, rooms and, and the bar downstairs. My dad also acted as bartender down in the uh, uh, bar, um, what should I say, tavern, the tavern in the Cliff House. The t Cliff House had a place called the Cave. The locals called it the Cave. It was a cute little uh, place to go have a drink. 
When you uh, moved here to Manitou, where did you live? Where did your family live? We lived in a house that the uh, Cliff House owned up Canyon Avenue, right behind. Uh, if you'll notice today, those uh, there are two little houses uh, immediately following the parking garage. Those were at one time owned by the Cliff House. And we lived in the two-story arts and craft house. So there are two houses there that are presently lived in by uh, Cliff House residents or employees. Uh, and yes. so it would have been one of those two houses behind yes. their parking lot. Yes. Uh, the Cliff House at one time where the uh, parking garage is now had a west wing that was torn down by some successor owner. Uh, hmm. I, why, I don't know, but it was uh, a much bigger hotel, if you will, square footage, but uh, we had 125 rooms at that time. And uh, you were part of the cleaning staff, weren't you? And During the summer months, yes. It, uh, I was a maid. We worked six days a week for $100 a month. <laughs> that was a lot. And we complained. Uh, we finally got a raise to 110 a month. <laughs> That's a big raise. Yes. Uh, one of the side star sad stories was that the bellhops used to steal our tips and we we maids really lost out a lot of money that oh, way. Oh goodness. Um, just for the benefit of our viewers, this is a photograph of the Cliff House and uh, it, it appears on our cover of the book that it is offered in our museum store and uh, that's what it would have looked like around the time Shirley worked there. Um, there's also in this book a photograph of a group known as the Cliff House Girls. And uh, these were servers in this photo. Yes. Um, and I guess that was a generic uh, term referring to any girls who worked at the Cliff House, uh, whether they were servers or uh, maids. And so it, the Cliff House itself has, has a very interesting history. I know in one of our previous conversations, you talked about a mineral springs on the premises and uh, where where do you recall where that mineral springs was located at the Cliff well House? it was a drilled springs it wasn't a natural springs uh, and it wasn't running when we lived there but uh it was up the alleyway from the back of the cliff house there's many things that were in that alleyway uh, attached to the cliff house that have been removed. So it's kind of hard for me to explain, but uh, the linen room was above the kitchen and the kitchen was attached to the hotel where to the dining room, obviously, but the dining room is now called the ballroom. So there's been a little reconfiguration. The mineral spring would have been up a little further to the east of the alleyway going north. Mm -hmm. And it was um, just a hole in the wall, so to speak. Uh, but uh, I don't know who drilled it or how long it had and it seems like the Cliff House itself has undergone some significant structural oh, yes. changes over the years, especially after the fire in the early 1980s. Yes. Um, and, it, and for several years, I know it laid vacant. Um, but, you know, on one of our, um, con during one of our conversations, you mentioned that you lived here twice. Yes. So what ha you left in the Cliff House initially in 1953 after finishing high school at yes. Manitou Springs High School. And then where did your family end up after that? Where did you go? Uh, well, uh, there's another story that you should know about the Cliff House and uh, the Nelford Corporation. Uh, in 1950, the Air Force, or maybe it was the Defense Department, I'm not sure which, wanted to reopen the Air Force Base in Colorado Springs. Now, 
was Ent Air Force Base that was downtown, which is now the Olympic Center, training center. And uh, because they wanted to open it right away, they asked my uncle if he would open up the Cliff House during the winter months mm -hmm. to provide bachelor airmen quarters. So there was a lot of young men come into the Cliff House during the winter months while we were closed. Well, I ended up marrying one of those young men and we then got transferred in 1953, moved to California. But my mom and dad stayed on till 1958 until uh, Nelford Corporation sold the hotel. Okay, so when Nelford sold, that's when your parents left the yes, operation. Yes, they went back to Chicago and worked for Happiness Tours. Okay. Um, so tell me a little bit about Happiness Tours. Um, did Happiness Tours operate here in Manitou Springs as well? Uh, no, they didn't have an office here. They just sent their tours here. I see. And uh, but everybody in town knew happiness tours because they brought a lot of tourists here and provided a nice income for some of the uh, the stores here in town. You know, it, it, again, it was only between Memorial Day and Labor Day that the the uh, curio stores made really good money. Exactly. So you mentioned you uh, married, you moved to California, and then when did you end up coming back to Manitou? Well, I um, went from California to Hawaii to the Rio Grande Valley of Texas, then lived in San Antonio, but got very restless. So my husband and I, my husband had lived in Colorado before. I must say this is a second husband. Uh, he had been an associate professor at the Air Force Academy, so he and I both loved Colorado, and we looked er everywhere and ended up in Manitou Springs again. <laughs> was that uh, by chance, or was that intentional? <laughs> well, it's really more by chance because we started looking in telluride mm -hmm. and because we were both skiers and we wanted to live in colorado because we kept coming up here skiing but uh i did have friends here he, and he had his old cronies from the air force academy so it was an ideal spot to land when you uh returned to manitou what did you do after returning? What did I do? I uh, re got reacquainted with my high school friends. There was a lot of the alums that lived here mm -hmm. and that um, then began another adventure for me into the history, not necessarily totally of Manitou, but of the Manitou High School. Well was history always an interest of yours? Well, I liked antiques and I always liked knowing about things, but Manitou just had that special something that was so different and it did change my life as a teenager when I moved here. Mm -hmm. Well, we're grateful that you ended up here at our museum. And uh, here at the museum, you supervise our archives department. So tell us a little bit about the archives and what kind of things are you responsible for oversight? Well, uh, you said it in a nutshell, I'm responsible for the oversight. Um, in my years away from Manitou, I worked for the Air Force and had a management position. So. I guess you might say that's my experience that I brought to the Heritage Center. When I got back with my alumni friends, uh, we began to talk about the old days. We started reunions for the old alums uh, from Manitou High School. And 
then we started bringing things from our past, in other words, artifacts, rings and yearbooks and everything to our reunions. And then that developed in establishing the Heritage Hall, the old school. Uh, and when I say old school, we all graduated from the grade school building when all 12 grades were in that building in Manitou. <laughs> And it just developed. And so from there, I started talking with other people about getting things together and starting a museum in general in Manitou and other board members now who you'll probably talk to soon. Uh, they, uh, brought in people, uh, experts on developing a heritage center. Well, I go through all of this background because we started getting donations from many, many people, not just the old school. We, we just collected a lot of stuff. Right. And over the early they, years, we were just people who were willing to take on that kind of job. But our archives did suffer a little bit because of lack of volunteers. We always need volunteers. Exactly. But, uh, and because everybody had a different way of doing things, uh, our archives just weren't up to snuff. And I used to complain all the time to the board of which I was a member, uh, that nothing was getting done with archives. So they finally said, well, surely you take it over and do something with it. So I've been working with the archives now for close to four and a half years. And with uh, gaining uh, or soliciting people to come in that I knew that loved old things they uh, we've been able to uh, really get our archives organized i am not an archivist a trained archivist i just put management pr principles to use in clearing up organizing and also raising money to buy the needed supplies it, that's one item that people don't think about. We have very good uh, archival uh, materials that cost a lot of money. Now, now, where did you get your management experience? Working for the Air Force. Uh, actually, if I may brag a little bit, I ended up being the manager for the whole Air Force of a suggestion program that w was out at every Air Force base. So I had a lot of experience working with developing programs, writing regulations, instructions, uh, developing forms, everything that we use right here. Well, here at the museum, Shirley, we're very proud of all the work you've done in developing our archives. Uh, should we take a moment and look at some of the things in our archives and collections? Yes, thanks to uh, Lou Archer's family, we now have a research room that we hope to open after the first of the year. Well, uh, the books that we have on the shelves primarily came from Lou. We have gotten donation of uh, library type documents, pamphlets, uh, brochures, books from other people. But one of our best collections in the research room is our old newspapers. The Pikes Peak Journal folks uh, donated all the old copies, this one being from 1888. 
and we go all the way through up into the 80s. Uh, we also have some of the newspapers on microfilm too for research. And if you want to look up anybody's address from way back when, we have city directories for uh, our uh, researchers to use. Okay. We also tell part of our Manitou history with uh, photographs, postcards, uh, pictures that we've hung on the wall. We intend to do more but narrative with research, these pictures is the place to come. Again, Shirley, who will take us through the archives room or the collections room, rather. Well, it is a collection of, of archives, artifacts, papers. Right here in this aisle alone, we have things about the Garden of the Gods, uh, Manitou history, railroads, the De Gear collection, the Pikes Peak Marathon. The Manitou High School collection, which is huge. We have over 1,600 individual items, scrapbooks and, and uh, yearbooks and class pictures. We have the library uh, histories here. Um, we have the Manitou Springs Women's Club history scrapbooks. And over here, we have post office and the Kiwanis collection. We have boxes of artifacts and information histories on the Navajo Hotel, which is the Barker House, and the Cliff House, the McLaughlin Lodge. We have objects from the McLaughlin Lodge. Watch and show that we're a repository for City of Manitou Springs documents. We do keep maps. Maps and building plans, architectural yes, plans. all sorts of things. We have all the blueprints from the post office construction, but we also uh, have things uh, my, my uh, worker bees really do a good job of, yeah. of <clears throat> saving things. And each one of these artifacts and articles and documents have its own archive number. Oh, yes, yes. So <clears throat> we can, you tell us what you want, and we can research our past perfect uh, data system to find it. But <clears throat> you can see we have a lot of. Manitou history. City, city ordinances, resolutions, uh, minutes, amongst other things. Correspondence, even stationary. Oh, goodness. We keep letterheads from years and years ago. And down here we have boxes filled with uh, hill climb photos filmed by Robert Jackson. We have many, many, many framed photos from the school, from different projects around town, such as the chair project. Cycle. Do we uh, ride that in the backyard here? Or what? <laughs> <laughs> what is that? That was donated to us. Uh, that is from the snow. Uh, now help me with the name snow climb that was run in january right on pike's peak yeah huh. yeah and um you mentioned uh robert jackson earlier who's a local photographer at one time he resided in dallas texas and uh, won a 1964 pulitzer prize for photojournalism involving his photograph of Jack Ruby assassinating Lee Harvey Oswald, who of course assassinated President John F. Kennedy on November 22nd of 1963. And uh, one of Mr. Jackson's pastimes was photographing the 
Pikes Peak International Hill Climb Race, which he did for over a period of 50 years. This is a sample of one of his earlier photographs from the hill climb. I would encourage people, if they have anything that they feel that their uh, relatives do not want to keep, but it pertains to Manitou, we would love to preserve it in our collection here. And we use these things. We don't just store them away. We do, such as the Jackson photos where Pikes Peak Hill Claim was an exhibit. We also have an exhibit that, that shows his involvement with the Kennedy visit to Dallas and subsequent assassination. Mm -hmm. uh, we have school uh, information that was used by the, the school district for their 150th anniversary. We welcome people to and come. research for anything that they might be doing. The Kiwanis very generously donated all of their history to us as when they decided they wanted to celebrate their, what was it, the 100th? The 100th anniversary. Yeah. That surely is instrumental in putting together many of the exhibits we'll be looking at here over the next several minutes. Uh, one of those exhibits is Heritage, an exhibit formerly known as Heritage Hall, which we refer to as Old School Manitou. And uh, Shirley, how did we uh, end up with this wonderful collection of high school history? Uh, I might add that the high school celebrated its 150th anniversary this past year. And, uh, but Shirley, you were responsible for acquiring many of the items seen here in this part of the museum. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit about this? When I moved back to Colorado, I started uh, meeting with, uh, once a year, with some of the old school uh, alums. And uh, we then started saying, well, why don't we resurrect our old reunions? Of, and it was an all-class reunion because our school, our high school was very small. My class was a class of 25. There are two of us still living in Manitou. Don Moses, who owns the Royal Tavern, and, and myself. And that was the class of 52, 1952. 50, 51. 51, okay. Class of 51. And... Um, so Don owned a, a tavern over on in old Colorado City also. And so he decided to throw a party and we invited more alums. And at that party, people brought some of their old memorabilia. Everybody loved looking at the old stuff because Mind you, we graduated 50, in the 50s and 40s, and here we are in the 90s getting together, looking at the old stuff. So that's how we got started, and it sort of grew into then a, an annual class reunion, and more memorabilia came to these class reunions and we said well why don't we put them on permanent display so we asked the school superintendent if we could display in the school and we got permission and from there the school secretary pulled out even more valuable really valuable uh, items from the closet that they had just stuffed away over here, we have the most used items for research is W.W. W. Bundy, who was our school superintendent's scrapbook. Wow. She also pulled out a box full of records about our most favorite professor, Prof. Richardson, J.B. Richardson.
Um, there's a long story about him. Um, I won't go into that, but come and learn about him. He's really an interesting Was fellow. he? Wasn't he in, involved in an explosion, an accident involving oh, an explosion? Oh, well, he was a student in Manitou. In fact, we have a picture of him as a very little boy. He went all 12 grades in Manitou. And while he was in high school here as a chemistry student, there was an explosion in. Oh, goodness. And, and um, also in our collection, we have um, any number of class rings. You want to tell us a little bit about the class rings and some well, of your friends who well, were owners of these rings? Well, one class ring, this one here is, I did not know her, but, but this is Mary Jane Roser's ring. She graduated in 1935. Her parents ran the uh, beautiful restaurant up on El Paso. Um, then even my classmates, my ring, that's 51. And which one's yours, Shirley? This one right right here. Okay. And I think I still could wear it. What kind of stone is that? There is no stone in our ring. Okay. For, I, I don't know what Mary Jane's is. This one from the class of 49. These from 52, 53. Tom Fawcett's 1956. Uh, Tom used to work at the post office here in Manitou. Maybe and, many people and, will remember him. And is, and is Tom the father of John Fawcett, our, our current fire, fire chief? Yes. And you have Betty Marie Sharpton's ring in there. Yes, she's the it, class, one of my classmates, 1951. Right, and she's currently living in Cody, Wyoming. Right, right. These are band medals. Uh, from various donors. Uh, I don't have all of them. Uh, this is from Clayne Robinson, Good Citizen Medal from the DAR. Uh, Henry Willie, class of 30. Oh, let's see what class. He was the class of 29. And he was somehow related to Mabel Willie, who was the he, first female mayor of Manchester. Yes. Uh, Henry was Mabel's son okay, and brother to Jack Willie, which many people know. Jack graduated from Manitou also, and uh, which brings me to another story. Jack Willie came back and taught here. When the high, new high school was built and they were clearing out the old high school if you recall, I just mentioned 12 grades in the old grade school building. Well, they were throwing away a lot of stuff and all of these beautiful banners here were in the trash. That was 1957, 56 or 57. And we did not start Heritage Hall until 1997. So he had them for 40 some years and then donated them back to us and put them on display. Well, there, there are certainly some very impressive sports trophies as well as banners here in our museum. And who would have thought a small high school like Manitou Springs would have won all these championships, both on a league level and a state level, well, and all different sports. And the good, the good news and the bad news about the trophies when we started Heritage Hall with the permission of the superintendent, they not only gave us boxes of stuff, they showed us that they had stored away, just thrown in haphazardly into a box, all of these beautiful trophies. Wow. So amazing. Uh, the alums uh, that I worked with, uh, got together there were four or five of us got together and we took them out and polished them up and tried to restore them back to their original glory that was tom forsett's wife uh or that our teacher's supply cabinet was used in the old school we were able to save that 
and many of the sports memorabilia, including a cheerleader's megaphone. We were very fortunate to get that. We also have a photograph of the 1911 championship team. And you mentioned James Richard. Uh, James is shown yeah. in that photograph, along with Theo Groves, who was Harry Groves' brother. Um, and Harry, of course, was an international rock star in constitutional law. Uh, but his brother was known for playing on our local baseball team here in Manitou Springs. And we didn't have the uniforms, so the Cave of the Winds donated their, or loaned their uniforms to our championship baseball team. Wow. <laughs> it's really interesting the way it worked. And our school uh, had was a very focal point in Manitou organizations even changed their uh, meeting dates so that they could go to some of our championship games. Van Briggle exhibit, and as many of you know, Van Briggle was a world-renowned potter who won several international pottery awards during his lifetime. He only spent a few short years here in Manitou from 1898 until his death on July 4th of 1904, but Shirley has some favorite pieces here in this exhibit case, and Shirley, you want to walk us through this? Sure, I'll be glad to. The oldest piece we have in the exhibit, it's a 1906 piece. Uh, it's after Van Briggle's death, but one of the original potters, Mr. Schlegel, we think, did this. We're not positive. That's one of my favorite. But all of these are from the 1920s. Uh, this piece is what got me started in collecting Van Briggle. Many of these pieces uh, are on loan from several people, and that this one is on loan from me. Going down this, uh, Several pieces have been donate, donated to us. This is a gorgeous piece. This was donated by a lady in Colorado Springs. This is a very unusual piece. Uh, but as far as favorites go, I love this piece here. Uh, she dates back to the 50s, early 50s. But I think, this is only my opinion now, uh, I think she was not very popular because it was shortly after World War II. And uh, uh, many people know that the Americans were not too happy with with the Japanese at that time. Somebody suspects they own a piece of Van Briggle. How do they identify Van Briggle? Is there a logo maybe, or what does the yes, logo look like? Yes, there is a logo. Let's look at this piece. This we're very proud of because this is one of 500. This is an anniversary piece, their 50, 75th anniversary. And on the bottom, you can see the Van Briggle logo and their name. And then this tells about the anniversary. And that, this, that logo is a double A for Anne and Artis Van Briggle. There are a few pieces of Van Briggle that are not marked. Why, I don't know. We don't have any in our collection, but um, another thing t about our collection here is that the last owner was from Manitou Springs. That's why we have this collection. But also uh, several people uh, lived in Manitou that were finishers for these pieces. Uh, this, these butterfly shades and the dried weeds were collected by um, a gentleman that lived here in Manitou. His wife was a finisher. 
Shirley, how did you start? How did you get started in collecting Van Briggle? Uh, well, it was that little piece that I pointed out. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew about Van Briggle, but never developed any interest until I moved back here. And then all of a sudden, my collection <laughs> took off. And then several other people uh, have items in here that uh, are just crazy about Van Briggle. Right. I love pottery, period, but Van Briggle is special. <laughs> Actually, my son found these pieces in Texas. Um, we find Van Briggle all over the country. Wow. We do have uh, another connection to uh, old Van Briggle that I'm trying to research. One of our alums either married or had an uncle that used to own it well before the last couple of owners, but I haven't been able to put that quite together yet. All right. But there's always something to be researched. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, does the public still have the opportunity to tour the old Memorial Van Briggle no, facility? No, it's okay. uh, owned by Colorado College and they have not opened it up. But okay. several years ago, the Heritage Center used to participate with the Women's Education Society from the college. Well, also during its lifespan, Van Briggle Pottery Company occupied several buildings including the Memorial Pottery located on Colorado Cam College's campus. Yes, this uh, building. And also uh, the old Midland Railway Roundhouse located at the corner of 21st Street and US 24. I would like to say that uh, I have been associated with the museum since the very beginning, in fact, was on the committee that established this many years ago and it has been quite a journey for the uh, three board members that currently serve and have served since the beginning uh, to come as far as we have we've got a tremendous museum we've added board members that have had knowledge that is really needed to keep a business going. And this really is a major, major business project, in my opinion, even though it's staffed by volunteers. Well, well thank you again, Shirley. Uh, my name is Michael Mayo, and um, I am a volunteer here at the Manatee Springs Heritage Center. Um, we'll be featuring Shirley, as well as other long-term residents of Manatee Springs, and a series of oral histories, which will appear on our website at Manitou Springs Heritage Center.org. And uh, we hope to see you again.